You're listening to another life-giving message from the Oasis Worship Center in Nashville, Tennessee. It's our prayer that this message will inspire and empower you for a positive change in your life and the world around you. And now, today's message. I'm glad that you're here this morning. We, we welcome, listen, on, on a Memorial Day weekend, if people go to church, you, you're fanatics, okay? So just, uh, you're in good company, all right? You are fanatics. Loving God, loving people, and serving the world. And, of course, on Memorial Day weekend, I say again, welcome to those that are watching by Internet. And uh, we do remember those that have given their life for the cause. And I'm actually going to be speaking about a cause today because there is a cause not only to defend America, but to defend faith, to defend faith. And, and it's not just al-Qaeda that has attacked a, a nation or freedom. There is a root spirit at work that wants to keep people in bondage. And do you know, you may never be on the other side of bars in a prison, but you can be very bound up. And there are millions of people who may never see the inside of a jail cell, but they live in a constant state of bondage and torment. And I believe there is a great cause worth fighting for. And I want to talk to you about that cause today. In about 40 days from now, there's going to be an event here in Nashville, Tennessee, and the name of it is The Call, The Call. And it is a gathering of, we believe, will probably be about 100,000 people. A large number of them will be young people crying out and repenting for the sins of the last 40 years. Because 40 years ago, this summer, it was called the the Summer of Love. Most of you are probably in this room not old enough to remember that. I was just a wee lad myself. I was nine years of age. But there was a seismic shift that happened that summer. The Summer of Love, if you don't know what it was, it was when about 100,000 young people converged on San Francisco and it was the year that they what was it they uh, uh, they 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 tuned in they dropped out they uh, that's the the summer of of psychedelic uh, drugs LSD was introduced that year like no other there was the invasion musically that happened that began to alter culture and it was a it was intentional and it was a plan of the enemy I believe to affect this nation but let me back up just a few years from 67 it was in 1962 and in 1963 that one woman decided she didn't want her child to pray in school her name was Madeline Murray O'Hare an atheist and there was just a simple prayer that was prayed every day in America's public schools. I'm going to read you that prayer in a moment. What's absolutely astounding, though, is that one atheist full of the devil had more power than an entire body of Christ in the United States. And she was successful in taking that complaint to the Supreme Court. And in one day, one day, A decree was signed in America that children, our students, could no longer pray in school. I hold a book right here called America to Pray or Not to Pray, and it was written by David Barton, and it is a historian. He he began to link the fall of America to the day that 39 million students stopped praying. You say, well, all 39 million students weren't Jesus people. But you know what? It's not the fact that they were Jesus people as much as it was that it was a very simple prayer that was actually based and rooted in the foundation of our nation and our founding fathers. And even before the Declaration of Independence was signed, Benjamin Franklin was one who stood up because there was such contention within the the, the different areas politically that were trying to be formulated in the United States to make the United States what it was. 
a nation founded on the freedom to worship God. That's what founded this nation. I'm going to say it again. That's what founded this nation. There was a desire to get away from Britain and the, the, the bondage it was, that was there, and there was a desire to come to a land where people could live free and worship freely. And let me tell you this. Basically, every educational institution that began in this nation, even the colleges, were, be, were begun to train people for ministry. Go back to the roots of Harvard. Go back to the roots of Yale. And you may find that very strange today because if you step on that campus today, it doesn't resemble that whatsoever. But Benjamin Franklin said, we must come together and pray together or this document will never be signed because there will never be unity. Therefore, we can't be the United States of America. But on one day in 1963, a simple, very, very simple prayer was stopped in our school system. It was this, 22 words. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee, and we beg Thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. 22 words, simple. But you get 39 million people praying the same prayer every day. Something happens. You say, oh, I don't believe it. Well, this book actually documents what began to change in our nation the moment that prayer was forbidden in our education system. And the God consciousness began to be removed from our culture. And it has continued. And there is a great war right now in America over whether God will be a central theme in this continuing century. When prayer was removed, astounding things began to happen statistically. The, the data here, first of all, what began to happen with the SAT scores, they began to plummet. And America, who used to be leading in education, is now falling far, far behind. But it began in 63. Once you stop asking for God's blessings on teachers, something began to happen to the education system. It began to plummet. In our second service today, we're going to honor graduates. But I'm telling you, America's graduates are far behind many, many nations today. And I believe it's because we stopped praying in our school system. Not only SAT scores, but premarital sexual activity. You ought to see the graphs in here. I wish I could just show all of the, you the graphs of immediately what began to happen. First of all, at the ages of 13 and 14, there were ba there were basically, you basically there was no sexual activity. Today, today, in schools, in schools today, we are hearing of 9 and 10-year-old boys raping 7, 8-year-old girls. It was unheard of before this. In fact, some of the biggest problems noted in the late 50s, early 60s were things like cutting in line. Today it's cutting throats. It was spit wads. Things like that. Today it's guns and bombs and we, we need metal detectors. No, you need heart detectors. The problem is at the heart level. Birth rates of unwed women and teenage girls begin to skyrocket. Is this message meant to condemn anyone? No, it's just meant to show you where we are and what we have to do. Something has to shift. Something has to change. And you know what? We can blame the Al-Qaeda. We can blame the politicians. We can blame everything we want to. But the only reason that the world is dwelling in the darkness it is is because the church is not walking in the light that it has. And if we will, you know what's sad is a few years ago, the homosexual movement began to say, come out of the closet, come out of the closet. The problem is, after they did, the church went in the closet, but they never came out. <sighs> Sexually transmitted diseases begin to skyrocket. Suicide rates begin to skyrocket. Divorce begin to skyrocket. Unmarried couples living together. Adultery. Uh, 
it, it, it is absolutely astounding what you can link to the moment that prayer was removed from school. There was a man that President Reagan tried to get into the Supreme Court. His name was Bork. Some of you may remember, you may not remember, but he wrote a book a number of years ago because he was one of the most intelligent men I ever heard. When I listened to him speak, I, 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 was, I was grieved when he did not make it on because the way he thought was in another league. But he was, uh, he was too much for truth, not so much just the Bible, but he recognized and realized the error of the American way. And he wrote a book called America, Slouching Towards Gomorrah. And I preach you a message today just because my heart is on fire and it's burning. And I, I think things can change, but the change is going to come, I believe, very possibly in the next 40 days. And let me tell you about a, a young teenager, about 17 years of age. A number of years ago, and he was a, he was a faithful son, a good son. He was the youngest son of eight, seven older brothers. He was a very obedient kid. In fact, he was the one that did the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. He was a musician. <laughs> he would have fit very well in, in this city. His name was David. In fact, I think this city, in somehow, in some way, is connected to him. This is even the county we're in is David's son county. I think there's a link. In the last days, he said that there would be a restoration of the tabernacle of David. David became known as this not only this, this worshiping king, but he came to fame because he took a giant out that nobody else would take out. And I believe that there is a David generation that is coming up. Forty years ago, 100,000 students converged on San Francisco and there erupted a free sexual moral decline movement in America that, is, that has caused a seismic shift in the way that America... Listen, and I've, I've been to Europe enough now that I see the future of America and I don't like what I see. It's only 1% to 2% Christianity in Europe now. And I'm saying, church, please, we've got to do something. How did it happen? I've talked to so many pastors. They said, we stopped praying. We stopped passionately pursuing God. Something happened. We settled in. We became rich, increased with goods, and had need of nothing. Except God is not there. There's something about this young teenager that I love because when his dad said, son, would you, uh, would you take some food to your brothers? They've been out there actually 40 days now. 40 days. Take notice of that. 40 days. They've been out there for 40 days and I, the battle should have been over by now. Well, it wasn't over because all of the Israelites were hiding in their tents. They had lined up in this valley of Elah, and they were going to battle with the Philistines, but this one big Philistine named Goliath kept coming out and taunting the armies of the living God. And to, to kind of try to put it in perspective, I, I, I don't know if the lights can catch me back here, but these three blocks right here, this would be around 10 foot tall. And that was about the size of Goliath. I'm right at about six foot, okay? Can, can you imagine a man, not probably just that tall, if he's that tall, he was probably fairly wide as well. Coming out day after day, and he said, listen, there's no reason for all of you to die. Just pick one champion among you. Just one. And for 40 days he taunted and defied not just the armies of the living God, but he defiled the name of God. He defiled the name of God. Pay close attention to what I'm saying. He, he used the name of God in profane ways. And the people of God did nothing. Something began to bother me years ago because I would hear the name of my God profaned. I don't know why it bothered me so bad, but it began to bother me, and I think it's one of the reasons God has liked me. 
Because it's like if, if, if GD things start dropping around, it just irritated me. I've gotten up and walked out of so many movies, I'm going, listen, I'm not going to pay to support this. And yet there is a tolerance. Listen, here's the problem with this. You go, it's just the language of the world. No, no, but the, the, the greater problem is, is that's the name that saved you, and it doesn't bother you. If you do happen to love your mom or your dad and somebody cussed your mom or your dad, would you just go, oh, well, that's just, that's just them. No, if you really love your mom or dad, you'd stand up and, and, and do something. You'd say something. Well, that was the unique thing about this teenager. 17, 18 years of age, he, he brings the bread. He's taking bread and cheese. He's the pizza delivery. Literally, that's it. I mean, he gets there, and, he, and he, when he gets to the scene of this battle, and I've said it many times here, but you have to hear it from a different perspective. The thing that annoyed him so severely was the language and the hedonism that was behind that. Everything that the Philistine people represented, the immoral sexual practices, the worship, the way they worshiped with sex, and all the different components and aspects of this. this David said, listen, he reaches, he reaches a place where, where he, he says, first of all, he starts talking. He starts asking questions. Is somebody going to do something about this? And his older brothers, Eliab, who are there, Eliab, he gets under conviction. He says, shut up. Just why don't you go back home? Why don't you take care of the sheep? Why don't you? I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, there's a, there's a hundred thousand going to show up in that Titan Stadium, and they're, they're going to say exactly what David said. In 1 Samuel 17 and verse 29, he said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And you know, the thing that I think, the thing that David did in the sheep field was he didn't just watch sheep, he fell in love with the great shepherd. He was, he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was the one who loved the Lord. He, he passionately loved God. And so when he heard God's name devalued and defamed the way that he did, he goes, somebody's got to do something about this. And so here he is, this, this kid, he, he's, he's, he's willing to take on something that big, that tall, when the whole army of Israel isn't. And he, he's called into the tent of King Saul. Saul says, why do you think you can do this? He goes, well... First of all, he said, I'll tell you, I was, I was watching my father's sheep and a bear and a lion came. And he said, I took them out. That would have been a Kodak moment. I mean, you know, if you could have had digital cameras there and you could have taken some snapshots, that, that would have been, that would have been the moment. That would have been something to, to that would have been on the internet. How many know that? I saw one this week about the hog that was killed. You see that hog? Anybody in the internet? <laughs> some kid killed the biggest, a thousand pound hog. I mean, it's all over the internet. But this would have been one of those moments. But he didn't have any pictures. All he had was a memory. Let me tell you something. Some of your greatest victories, nobody will be there to see. Because they are private victories. I asked the Lord years ago, I said, Lord, how, how come there's not any great, great victories for the church happening publicly? He said, because there are no private victories happening. There's no, there's no pride. What do you mean? When nobody's watching. When, when, nobody's, when nobody's taking pictures. When, no, when nobody's paying attention and you have the opportunities for compromise. Come on. You see, it was, with David, it was just, it was, not even a, it was not even a sheep that the lion and the bear came after. It was a lamb. That's a sheep nugget. That's what it was. It was little. It's like, who's going to notice? This is such a small sin. Nobody's ever going to know what I've done here. Nobody's ever going to know that it was, just, it, was just, it was just sex one time. It was just this one time. It was just I only stole just a little bit. It wasn't a lot. It was only a small compromise. David said, no, every, every, every one of them matters. When you think of a lamb, you think of innocence. I, I see David going after that to protect the innocence. And, and, and God, 
liked something about David so much so that when he got there, he, he said, will no one, is there not a cause? Will no one do something about this? He said, I will. And the thing that bothered him was how the name of God was defiled. How the name of God was defiled. Does it bother you that the name of God is defiled? Does it bother you? I, I, years ago, I, I, I reached a point. I said, okay. I read, I read a scripture that says, Lord, I'll say, David said this. He said, I'll say among the nation, I'll, I'll say among the heathen that the Lord reigns. That's what he said. I'll say among the heathen that the Lord reigns. In other words, I'm not even going to wait till I get to church. We can't even get people in church to praise God. David said, I'm not even going to wait till I get to the temple. I'm going to praise God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find some skirt-chasing, dope-smoking, pagan, heathen, who's just defiling the name of my God, and I'm going to praise God right in front of him. I'm just going to do that. Uh, you, you have to love that about David. He just, he didn't care. Well, I remember when God began to deal with me about that, I went, okay, well, Lord, do you want me to do that? And I really felt like, he, he, you know, he talks to me. He said, I, I, I'd appreciate that. I, I think it would be great. It's okay, God, the next time somebody uses your name in vain, I'm going to praise it. I'm going to praise it louder than they took it in vain. That was hard. That was a tough thing to do because a lot of people use his name in vain. And I remember the first time I, I, was, a little, I was at some kind of a convenience store and somebody said it and I went, here it goes. And I walked off kind of away from him. God, I give you praise. I just praise you over here. He said, I want you to do it over there. <laughs> but there was that moment. And again, I'm trying to make a comparison because, see, God was extracted from the conscious, the psyche of the education system by the Supreme Court in 1962 and 63. We, we lost our moral compass. We've lost our way. Listen, America has lost her way. And even though we, our money still says in God we trust, most people don't trust in God. Okay, and, and so what is done right now on TV couldn't even pass the movie ratings in the 60s. What, what, what's done in a soap commercial? And you go, why, why are you talking about these things? Again, listen, I just came from Europe. You can't, you can't even have a TV because of the moral filth that comes across the airwaves, public airwaves, not cable, public. Where did it start when the church stopped defending the name of God? Is there not a cause? The name that we call on, the name that saved us, that we don't defend it. You don't defend it, you don't love it. I'm going to say that again. You don't defend it, you don't love it. You don't defend it, you don't love it. Yeah, ask, ask my wife how many movies we've got up and walked out of. I'm, I'm going to support it. You know why? Where my treasure is, that's my heart is. So I, w would you pay somebody to come into your house and profane the name of your God? Here, come on in. Just, just, just cuss up a storm. Just go on. Just come on in. Do it. Just take the name of God. Just walk right in the living room. Come on. But when you walk into the theater, you do this. Here you go. Ten bucks. What does it cost now? Eight, ten. It's really quiet in here, isn't it? I dare, I dare you. Try it. Just, just today. Take the challenge. Take the challenge, the cause, challenge. What is that, Pastor? I'm going to give you a couple things to do to defend the name of God. Let's start with that one. Is there not a cause? Do you think God's name needs to be exalted in this nation again? Hmm? You think it needs to be held high? Do you think we need to honor and esteem it, not just in a church service, but everywhere we go? What are you saying? I'm just saying, the next time you hear someone profane the name of God, how about you praise it? What do you mean? How would I do that? Well, you know, for me, it was a, it was a little embarrassing at first because I wasn't in church. I wasn't accustomed to doing that. No, I could compartment like separation of church and state. 
Well, listen, I, this, is, this, is not, this is not a legal document thing that I have with God. It's a love relationship. So, I, you know, I, well, I, though I got married in church, I don't just act married in church. Though you may have just come to Christ in a, in a church building, come on. The relationship extends beyond the building. Why? Because it's in the heart. And if you really say, till death do us part, come on. How about taking a stand? Somebody profane your wife the second you, stop, you, you step out of a wedding ceremony, somebody profane your wife? Dude, come on, the love is still hot and heavy at that point. You're going to take them out even if they're that tall. If you can't, you're going to get you a gun or a bazooka or something, hire you some mafia. You're going to do something to take the guy out that is profaning the love of your life. God's going, I want your heart to burn for me more than that of anyone on this planet. And when David, see, David had that. He had that kind of passion, that tenacious love, that relentless love that he's going, are you guys going to let this big bozo talk about our God the way he's talking about him? And God's going, yes, finally. Somebody willing to defend my name. I said it last week, you know, D David, David only mentioned the Goliath, G G giant Goliath one time. He mentioned God nine times. This is a guy, come on. They, 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 the Supreme Court couldn't pull out his prayer life. Here's what I'm saying. If, it get, if you get the real deal, listen, the Supreme Court can't tell you what you can and can't do. Pray anyway. There's been a movement of people trying to get prayer back in school, I'm going, can we get it in the church first? That would be a novel idea. Let's have that some passionate prayer in church. Let's have that some passionate prayer at home, not just over dinner. Help me out up in here, y'all, today. I'm just saying, where are the warriors? Where's the warring spirit? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And so I you know, I just, I just started going, okay, well, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Man, it, it, some rather interesting things have happened over the years. And it's just, I'll start praising God in very peculiar places. And it is fun. It probably got to be fun. I got to where, okay, this is cool. First time I did it, I was like, well, I'll praise you, Lord. I bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're a good God. Hallelujah. That didn't do much, though. But I got a little bolder. I hear somebody ripping off some, some profane thing. I got. Praise God. They said, what'd you say? I said, praise God. What'd you say that for? Well, I just thought if you're going to run down, my God, I'd lift him up. It's right here. You're crazy. You're right. I'm crazy in love with God, and I just have decided that I'm going to say among the heat. You sound like a heathen to me, so I thought I'd praise God in front of you. <laughs> and just little by little, and some really amazing moments have happened over the years in places where we've done this. God would show up in powerful ways. The, the, the after effect of that is it began to rub off on other people. And I've heard of the most amazing stories that happen when people begin to call on the name of God. Back in 1996, we rallied several hundred thousand teenagers into Washington, D.C. to pray. And there's another event that's coming. And here's, the, here's the, the cause I'm asking you to embrace today. Starting on the evening of, of uh, uh, the 28th. Is that tomorrow? Is that right? Starting on the evening of the 28th after you've had all the hot dogs and the burgers you can. All right? But on the evening of the 28th through July the 7th, it will be 40 days. And I'm going to ask you to take up the cause for 40 days and pray and fast. I don't think it can happen just walking into that stadium unprepared. And you see, I believe that each of us in our own way have giants that we face. Giants that really maybe a lot of people don't know about. Some of you really struggle with the giants of intimidation. Some of you, 
struggle with giants of fear, insecurity. Some of you have giants of addiction that nobody else knows about. But they're very big and they're very real. And I believe that as we consecrate the next 40 days and we say, God, I'm, I'm willing to do without, without some food. I'm willing to maybe turn off the TV set. I'm willing to do without some things. 40 days of consecration. We can, we can see that seismic shift. Do, does anyone in this room agree that the late 60s were such a tumultuous time and a shift for our nation? Would anybody agree with that? Even if you weren't living back then, if you look at historically the things that happened, the, you know, the, the, it, was, it was a weird and bizarre time. And we missed a window. But a generation has passed. And I believe that there can be a moral shift and a spiritual shift in America. And wouldn't it be just like God to do it in Nashville, Tennessee, which really is the buckle of the Bible belt because judgment must first begin at the house of God. And interestingly enough that he would do it in a David son county to take out the giants in the land. Come on. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Is there not a cause? Is there, is there not a cause? I believe there is. And I'm going to ask you to answer that call. The call to pray, to seek the face of God. How many in this room would just be honest enough to say that my relationship with God could be much stronger than it is today? Would you just raise your hand? That's all of us. Let me ask you this question, because for me, and I don't know, I don't know what happened, but over, over the last year, there's just been a sense of just busyness and not so much, not, hang on, I'm going to play a song here, and we're going to play this together, and just worship together with this song that says, I, I, I will pray. I, I wrote it a long time ago, but it fits this moment because it says, I answer the call. I answer the call. This, this event is, the name of it's the call, and it's a call to pray. It's a call, it's a, this is not a meeting like the Luis Palau thing was. This is, a, this is a moment for the church to get together and, and, and lay aside our differences and passionately call on the name of God to heal our soul and to heal our nation. If the church doesn't pray, nothing is going to happen. Do you get that? Come on, we can't vote the right people in to change the spiritual climate of America. It's the church's job. We can't keep deferring this to others. As we take this responsibility, for, for me, I've never had to fight to pray like I have in recent months. It's like, man, I, it, it, it is a battle. Am I living in sin? Am I doing stuff wrong? No, I just get busy. And man, I'll go, I need, I, need to, I need to get some time with God. I mean, you may not even think that way. Maybe you don't think that way, but I, I think that way. You know why? Because when I start getting irritated pretty easy, I start getting frustrated pretty easy. I blow up all of a sudden at somebody. Come on, how many Christians in this room blow up at people? Some of you blew up this morning. It's like, that's why you get in church. Can't praise God. I just cuss my wife out. You, but... But, you know, th there are so many things that are just siphoning off our energy and our attention. And then here it is at the end of the day. Man, I, I didn't get the time with God that I wanted. Oh, and then it's another day. And then it's another day. And then I'm realizing, man, I, man I'm, I'm short with people. I'm snap. And it's like, if, if you're even seeing that with other people, go, you need to go pray. I'm not your problem. You know what? I'm, you're not fighting against flesh and blood. But as we answer this call, I'm going to, you know, something happened in each stage of my life when there has been a seismic shift spiritually, it was preceded by very intentional fasting and seeking God. And what does that look like for you? On the internet this week, we'll have some things that will help you. I pray that you'll at least be able to do without meats and sweets, kind of a Daniel fast. We've done this before, but we've never done it based around an event that is coming that is very intentional about turning a generation and a nation around. How many would like to see 100,000 believers in that Titan Stadium praying and crying out to God? Not entertained, not entertainment, 
it, it, this won't be an entertainment event. So it's not about who's we, named. You're not seeing names of people and artists and all that. It's not about them. This is about the church coming together to pray and to seek his face. But I think if we don't pre-consecrate and set aside time, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. And so if you're willing to take that cause, is there not a cause? You know, until you really find something worth dying for, you never really live. And what would you want written on your epitaph? What, what, what would you want written on the tombstone if, if you go by way of the grave? Danny Chambers gave his life for. What would it say on yours? And what's the cause you're willing to give your life for? See, when David said that, he knew he was willing. He was willing to die for that cause. That's how important the name of God was to him. How important is the name of the Lord? Is it, is it something, if somebody came in and said, are you a Christian? Got a gun to your head? You remember Columbine? You Christian? <laughs> Would you take a bullet? I brought that question up in Europe last week. And they said, the churches here would empty out the moment somebody came in with a gun and said, well, are you willing to die for your faith? No, they said they, would, they don't have that level. But you ask the underground church in China, the 100 million strong, they had to factor that in when they made the decision. That's what it would have meant, count the cost. Why? Because if it's the real deal, we made it so easy. Just bow, everybody bow your head, nobody looking around. Don't want anybody to be embarrassed about being identified with Jesus. Come on, that'd be like you walking up and shrouding your wife, covering her up, don't want anybody to see her, say, I do. Don't want anybody looking around while I say, I do. No wonder the church is so weak and ineffective. We don't have, we, 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 we can't even get our hand in the air. We can't even get people in the water. Baptizing. Are we willing to answer the call? He's calling right now. Will you pick up the phone? Caller ID is going. This is God. Will you pray? Will you seek my face? He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven and I will will heal their land. You know where he'll start, first of all? He'll start with you. He'll start healing your land. He'll heal you of your wounds. He'll heal you of those secret scars that nobody knows about. That you're saying, I have this addiction, or I have this issue because of this abusive thing, or this person that ran off and left me, or this thing that happened to me. He'll begin to heal you of your wounds and your heart. See, then you become a, a conduit of healing. It's hard to be extending healing to someone when you haven't received it yourself. It's hard to extend forgiveness when you really haven't forgiven yourself or learn how to receive forgiveness. You do that. You answer that call. Every time I've sought God in that way, there was such a shift that happened in me at the personal level and at the ministry level. And something very weird is me. First of all, you're going to get very tender. You cry all the time. Like you start going without food. It's not, you'll get grouchy for a little bit. But then, then like somebody will say something, and you'll just you'll weep. What am I crying for? because all the flesh is being removed and there's a tenderness about you and you care about people and compassion begins to flow. Christ is flowing in you and through you. Play that song because we're going to answer this call together. And here's how we're doing it at the end of this service. Is it's just a yes, God. There is a cause. There is a cause and I'm answering that call right now. I, I, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to pray. And while we do that, it's not just this moment, but starting on the evening of the 28th, for 40 years, this is the 40th anniversary. I'm ready to see it turn around. I believe we can turn this nation around. If 100,000 people start praying, I answer the call, hearing your voice down on my knees. I made the choice to humble myself 
and pray. No matter the cost, paying the price, Lord, I will give the sacrifice to humble myself and pray. And I will pray and seek your face. I will touch you with my I will pray and seek your face, and I will touch virtue flow, healing our soul. I answer the call. Come on, let's do it right now. I answer the call, hearing your voice down on my knees. I made the choice to humble myself and pray. No matter the cost, no matter the cost, paying the price, Lord, I will give the sacrifice to humble myself and pray. Come on, let's do it right now. Sing, I will pray. Seek your face, I will touch you with my worship. Come on, let's pray today. I will pray, seek your face. That's what happens when you worship. I'm going to pray right here today. Seek your face. Because when I touch you, verse flows. Healing our soul. Here's what I want you to do. If you say, Danny, I'm going to answer the call. And I'm going to dedicate and consecrate these next 40 days however you work that out it's between you and God but that there is something consecrated about that time if that's you I'm going to ask you to step out from wherever you are and just come and stand here and let's consecrate this moment together right now because I, we, we've got to reach for God we've got to crank it up come on we've got to do everything that's in our power to touch him come on raise it up raise it up Sing, I will pray, seek your face, I will touch you with my worship, God, we're reaching for you, I will pray, yes, I will.
lives for a moment. It's not over. You know, a lot of times we we just get with Jesus long enough to get our own personal needs met. When we're having a crisis or a conflict or something's going on in our life, we know to pray, but, but we sometimes stay just long enough to get what we need. And I hear what God is saying now in these 40 days. I want you to stay with me long enough that it, you get so much of me it begins to spill over. Because then it's not just for you. You're praying not just for your own family, but for the families of this city, for this nation. So right now, we realize, God, we set aside 40 days for 40 years of moral failure in America. We consecrate the next 40 days. God, to seek your face, to touch you with our worship. God, to pray for our families, to pray for Nashville, to pray for a generation. Lord, for a nation that seems to have lost its way. We cry out to you. And right now we pray for the nations of the world. We pray for the cities in America. God, we pray that you begin to move in every nation of this world. We pray right now for Iraq, not just for a military victory, but for a spiritual victory. God, that you would silence the foe and the avenger. God, throughout the Middle East, Iran, Afghanistan, Syria, we pray for peace, the peace of Jerusalem. God, we pray right now for Africa. We pray for Indonesia. We pray for China. We pray for Australia. We pray for Canada. We pray for Mexico. We pray for Colombia, God. We pray for Brazil. Come on, begin to pray, church. Let God hear you crying out. Lord, heal this nation. Heal the nations. Come on, say it again. I will pray. I will pray and seek your face. I will touch you. See, virtue is flowing, power is flowing not only to you, but through you, for the world around you. God, we pray with everything that's in us. We reach for you. We reach for you. I will touch you with my worship. God, stir up that heart of worship in us. Stir up that heart. To seek you, Lord, with everything that's in us. When I touch you, virtue flows. And it's healing my soul. You're, you're being healed right now. I answer the call, hearing your voice. Down on my knees, I make the choice. Humble myself and pray. To humble myself and pray. Oh, yes, we do, Jesus. To humble myself. out every eye closed father we consecrate this moment to you and we dedicate this moment to you Lord right now that you would stir our hearts to worship stir our hearts come on put your hand over your heart I've just been asking God this has been my prayer over the last few weeks and it's beginning to happen my heart hasn't burned like it used to burn can you remember when you first fell in love with Jesus? Can you remember that? You remember how your heart burned? Come on, can we just pray, God, give us the burning heart once again? Come on, make that your personal prayer. God, give me the burning heart once again. That I won't get caught up in the routine of religion and, and church life and forget the love of my life, that you are the love of my life. 
that all that I do, God, it has to flow out of this relationship with you. My work, my family, everything. Stir up that heart within each of us. Pray these words with me. Now, Jesus, today I consecrate a fast in my life for 40 days between now and July the 7th a consecrated time that I seek you more passionately than I ever have that I pray not only for my own relationship with you but for my city my nation this generation and God that we could see 40 years that were lost recovered and this generation that's coming be the David generation that takes the head off the giants in our land bring freedom to America again let freedom reign in this nation not political freedom spiritual freedom in Christ Jesus may we make your name famous Lord may we not tolerate those who defile your name may we have boldness and courage like David to stand up and honor your name among the nations among the people Lord God we pray today for revival in our hearts in our cities in our nation and in our world in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God the praise today. Hallelujah.